Welcome, everyone. My name is Jim Schley, and I want to thank, first of all, the North Chapel. This is the Unitarian Society of Woodstock, and for many years, this has been a pretty ideal home for poetry for Bookstock. And um, it's an unusual church in being not so deep and a little bit wider, but it's wonderful sound and beautiful light. Please silence your cell phones and other devices that might squeak. Um, the restrooms, there's one straight through that door. There's another one right here. And downstairs, there are two more, in case there's a line. And the church has asked that we not have food in here, so keep that in mind. All the events this weekend are free, and um, if you see in your program a proprietor of a business you know, be sure and thank them for supporting Bookstock. In addition, though, there's a traditional sap bucket um, which welcomes donations, and they will be put to good use. So that's right below me and ready for contributions. And we also have an email sign-up sheet on the music stand there if you'd like to be kept apprised of future Bookstock Adventures. I'm entranced to welcome poet and translator Jody Gladding. Born in York, Pennsylvania, Jody's work reflects and refa- refracts the practice of ecopoetics, which locates inextricably the process of composing in the locus of our corporeal and ecological moment and the ephemeral location based work of poets like Cecilia Vicuna, Vicuña, and sculptor Andy Goldsworthy. Jody creates poems that appear to be occurring in process, syntactically and typographically, and even sculpturally, showing, and here I'm quoting from the Poetry Foundation's website, the interactions between life and art, lingering in fields of close contact, areas marked by interruption, damage, or receptivity. Her debut collection, Stone Crop, was chosen by James Stickey for the Yale Younger Poets Award. She's also the author of the poetry collections Rooms and Their Heirs, Translations from Bark Beetle, and the new The the Spider's My Arms, along with two limited edition chapbooks, Artichoke and The Moon Rose. Jody explained her process and approach to 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 composition. Um, This is interesting to the typesetter, of her third collection of poems, Translations from Bark Beetle, this way. Quote, I'm very interested in how poetry exists in three-dimensional space, in physical acts, in the world at large. For me, this has led to my poems increasingly moving across the page, then off the page, sometimes coming into being as or on objects. The shapes they take on the pages of this book are the traces of that moment, movement. When I was the director of the Frost Place in Franconia, we invited Jody to live in Robert Frost's old homestead as poet in residence. In the preceding spring, there had been a catastrophic storm, leaving much of the adjacent forest smashed and splintered. And over the course of the summer, I watched her move from her perch on the back porch of the house into the transformed and transforming woods, working like a spider among the upended tree trunks and split saplings, using bright red cloth and words on timber slabs and stones to annotate the disaster in place. So I have the sense that a gladding poem is always on the verge of springing off the page, and sometimes they actually do spring. Jody has also translated about 30 works from French, including The Serpent of Stars by Jean Giono, Rambeau the Sun by Pierre Michon, and Green, The History of a Color by Michel Pastoreau, and brand new, If You Cross the River by Geneviève Damas. Jody has taught at Cornell University and the Vermont College MFA program, and until recently she's been the director of the writing program at the Vermont Studio Center. Please welcome Jody Gladden. what I'm going to read. Thank you. 
Okay. So first of all, thank you, um, Jim, for that introduction, and thanks to the Bookstock for having this event. Um, the one of one of the chapbooks that Jim mentioned, Artichoke, he actually published, and um, it was a wonderful experience uh, with Jim and Anne Aspel, um, who will be here later. Uh, so. As Jim said, my poems have increasingly moved off the page and onto objects. And then in the latest book, um, The Spider's My Arms, which you have the cover of, it looks like this. Uh, they, they moved back, um, I want to say they moved back into the page in that my sense of these poems is that and what I hope they do is that they, they open the space of the page itself into something that has three dimensions and can be moved through as a reader. Um, so I want you to be able to see them with me, and I want you to um, maybe enter a different relationship with the poem than you normally would in that y you... You are, you are part of the making of it. The poem exists as we make it here right now. Um, and, and you have guidance for that in that there is in each of these poems a through line, uh, which is in bold. And that is kind of a way into the space of, of the poem. And then once you enter, you'll find constellations of words sort of circling around that through line. And you are pretty free to draw those constellations in different ways as, as you like. So I'll, I'll read these poems, but um, bear in mind that as I read them, it's just one reading, um, one way, one possibility, and, and not at all definitive. And, and each time it, it can be read, <coughs> each time you enter, it can be done differently. So I'll start with um, the Hawthorne. The Hawthorne in flower was my first alphabet. The Hawthorne came into flower, <coughs> a first white flame turning the alphabet to kindling. That line, um, many of these lines come from other sources, the through line, and that one is a, a line from a poem by Renee Shar. Actually, that's, that's the whole poem. Um, I thought it needed a, a compliment. And I think of that one as kind of working like a like a double helix, so that one line starts and then the other one kind of wraps around it. Um, the, 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 the movement of the poem can go many different ways, but that, that's one of them, just sort of working down and through from the top to the bottom. <coughs> Snow geese. The force flowing against us is also ours. Snow geese, the force of their argument, this outflowing of words. The wind against us, we listened quietly, also diminished, also arranging ourselves against the wind. Use it carefully and every day. So the next poem, Cut, is a sort of condensed version of the bigger ones in that um, the, the title or the through line is, begins on, on the first line and then turns into a word, usually just one word in, in the poem itself. <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah. So this is probably something for any of you who are gardeners familiar with, cutworm. C 
cut through thin necks of broccoli starts, I woke, turning my head slowly. Field study. White, yellow sweet, red. Well, we learned this summer, hop, white sweet, early, clovers. Why not early, large leafed, rough stemmed, the golden rod? Why not tall, yellow rumped, yellow throat, common yellow throat, yellow, the confusing fall warblers? Um, The next one is a line from uh, Henry Thoreau's journal, which I've taken to reading every day. (laughs) I read the entry for the day, um, and it's always the day 160 years before. So right now I'm on um, July 27th. Um, Henry Thoreau is 32, and he's just starting to complain about... um, Uh, flies bothering him when he walks through the woods. So it's kind of comforting because the same phenomenon that he notices or complains about or uh, appreciates uh, is happening right, right now, right here. The finest grasses support the most wonderful burdens of ice. The finest grasses will whistle held taut to the lips Grasses will support nests, red wing, the last note held, wonderful facets of hoarfrost by bending, burdens of ice. Till she could walk, I carried her, bending the light at my hip. She pieces together her joy. She is one who looks to remnant species. She is one who looks knowingly upon complex modern machinery as a joyous substitute. An artist starts from the salvage. She threads through old growth. She is one who looks to patch together blue sky, salvage of wetland. An artist, she is an artist. She don't look back. And this is the um, title poem of the Spider's Book. Which um, I wrote when uh, I was spending some time in France and I was working on a, um, a project that involved a, a boree, which are those standing stone, dry stone structures that are sort of all over the landscape and they were they're kind of mysterious they they were shelters that apparently um, shepherds or other farm workers uh, 
agricultural workers would build to protect themselves from sun or whatever the elements were. Um, and I, uh, I, I had found this one that I was kind of in love with, and I was threading red threads through it. Um, and it was had a whole spider population in there. Um, and and I would work for a day, and I'd come back, and the spiders would have taken my red threads and woven them into their own webs. Um, so it felt very much like a, um, a collaboration after a while. And this poem partly resulted from that. What I mean by rooted is web. The spiders have been revising my lines my arms full of laundry at the end of the day. What I mean by rooted is not taproot, but web, old stumps cling with, all the entanglements. So those are all from um, this last book. And the next set are all ones I've written since then. The mother tongue licked me into being. I entered without words for purple, aster, yellow, center. I entered the mother tongue Deep summer calls star into being. The mother tongue licked me articulate. I keep waiting because people keep coming in and (laughs) I want to welcome them. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. We're on we're on page ten. For those of you coming in, are there still handouts available or um so maybe you wanna sit next to someone who has one? And the next one is also, if you garden, you'll recognize this annoyance as well. Call it harvest. Best to handpick the rose, the gooseberry. Best to handpick the rose chafer, gooseberry leaves skeletonized. Best to call it all harvest. Best of all, what can be gleaned, ground flat, beneath my thumb. (coughs) The heart of summer gleams. In the heart of summer, a hornet In my black currants, full to bursting of summer, stung by a hornet, my child storms off. A hornet gleams, lightning storms, never far off. messy eater. When I'm alone, I chew through the cord, devour the sack. Our young register damage in their flesh. These are young small tattooed herds, bells in many registers, rippling radiantly, our damage 
radiantly infirms their flesh. Um, if you're just coming in, you, you might want to sit next to someone that has a handout. Thank you. So we're on page 14. In my sickness, the sky kept spinning. I lay amazed in my sickness. I lay amazed at my sickness, amazed at the floorboards, the light bulbs, how all that could be firmament how all the sky kept spinning. In my bed, linen, blue flax from linen thread that could be firmament kept spinning. What the hawk does, fly. What the horse, dragon, fire, cluster, fly does. We had more words for it when we had wings. Um, The next two, if you open your pages, I just spent um, the month of May in in France, and I I was working on these poems there, and because there's so few words, it seemed very easy to, like, do them in French as well. Um, So I tried some of those, and I just included a few here for fun. Um, And the interesting thing was I would do it in in English, and then I would do it in French, and it would come out just a little bit different, because uh, obviously you can't do the same thing in one language as you can in another. Um, So, this is one of those. I seek the cold mountain spring. I seek the ice-cold shock of a mountain spring. I seek the ice-cold and solitary motive from which I spring. À la montagne, aigue et solitaire, je cherche le motif glacé, je cherche la source du jaillie. jailli. Wind wrenches free her tongue. Escaping small talk, wind screams through the village gates. Wind screams through the child. The child wrenches free from her mother. Her wild shrieks, all meaning. Her mother tongue, unbound. swallows light in the open. The mountain swallows the last of the sun, flashing back its light, circling the village walls in search of the open wounds. Or you could do the mountain swallows flashing back, circling 
in search of the open. La montagne reflète la blessure. Au soir, la crête de la montagne engloutit le reste du soleil. Les hirondelles reflètent sa lumière. Elles tournent autour des murs du village à la recherche de la blessure ouverte. I think I will stop there. Thank you. Um, so we have some time. If yeah, you want to questions. questions or have just you ever anything like that? <laughs> that's one question uh, over here. Perfect. Um, so do these poems? <coughs> start with the through lines, or is that something you discover once you're in the process, what the through lines will be? Um, usually they start with a through line, but not always. And that's and sometimes I've started with a through line and then written the poem, and then realized that that wasn't the through line at all, and, and then it, another thing becomes bold. And bold. Yeah. So you yeah, yeah, and uh, often it is like uh, uh, many of these have come from something I was reading or, you know, something I hear, like the through line itself, uh, often the source of it is not something that I made up. Um, what happens around it usually is, but I, I feel pretty free to incorporate, you know, the idea of it being my own words isn't that important to me. Um, so I tend to incorporate other language that's, yeah. Yeah. Do you have one preferred way to read the poem, or does it depend on your mood, how you would read it differently? Yeah, um, it's interesting because some of these I've never read before, so I don't know if that's the preferred way. I mean, they generally will go in the way one reads, which is, you know, top left, bottom, right, but not in a direct route, circuitously. Um, so yes and no. <laughs> I mean, so generally yes, but, but with variations. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I think that sort of, in my mind, there's a little Asian painting, mm -hmm. that I follow very, very, very from the top to the bottom. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's a good comparison because there, um, there's a lot of vertical movement and in the way that an Asian painting will have these scales where the closest thing will be the darkest and then get lighter. So that you have a scale that way as the pers it's not perspective, I guess is what I'm saying. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Good. I'm glad it, it works that way for you. Yeah. Yeah, Becky. So, uh, not really, that it kind of invites one to think of how could you present them in a less linear way? Mm hmm. Right. Yeah, and I've played with that, especially with the field study one, where, you know, the voice of like the names of the different species, which is all in italics. That could very easily be like a field of just that language and then someone reading the other things through it. So I, I haven't really found the best way to present these orally. Um, I, I feel pretty co confident with how they look on the page, but um, I have projected them. That's another way of doing it, which means that everyone's attention is sort of up there. And I'm not sure. You know, I, I kind of like having the paper too because I feel like they are in the paper. But um, yeah, I would like to I would like to play with those possibilities <laughs> a little more. Yeah. I um, I read the ones that are in this with the paper, and then after that I didn't have a handout, and I found that, that I was happy to listen, and that I also noticed 
maybe even more so, that I was hearing phrases where the emotional aspect came to the fore. Like where a child is referred to, or an action with the broccoli. Or, mm -hmm. And so they're not, they're, they're, they're not random, and they're, the drama in them is so quiet, but audible. And that's what I really appreciate about the amount of space they take on the page. That it's there, but it's, but I need to participate. Mm -hmm. I'm not being handed a narrative in a way that's easy to take in, to work with. And I like that alertness that calls upon in me. Which is another way it, it maybe connects to Chinese sensibility or aesthetic in that um, if you think about Chinese poetry, how you have to sort of, um, they're so imagistic and you have, you have to, you as a reader have to kind of create those images for yourself to be inhabiting as you read in the same way that the paintings are that way. So yeah, there's, there's much more a sense that the reader is not a passive receptor but an active participant in in the making of it, of the experience. Yeah. Uh, I'm curious about the physical things that you did. I'm supposed to you know, the word correctly, but the bori, you know, the, the bori. Mm -hmm. Do you feel that those are uh, part of this po poetic process, and, and and what happens with those? Yeah. Um, definitely, that uh, they definitely are. Like my sense that that poetry exists in three dimensional space and in the world at large, uh, it informs all that work and then informs these poems as well. Um, what happens with those probably is much more. I would imagine like what happens with installation artists that you go into a space and you see what it is offering to be. Um, there's a line uh, Anne Hamilton in one of her books says, um, I enter a space where language can come into being or into being something else. And that in those projects, that's sort of where they take off from. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Order that you expect the reader, or are you glad to have people find their own way of reading? I really would like people to find their own. Um, I, I hope I don't have an order <laughs> that I expect the reader to find, because then the reader is in a position of looking for something um, that's predetermined by someone other than themselves. And I would hope these poems allow the reader to um, to own them. Yeah. 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 When you've read them before, have you found that you the order that you choose to you know, be kind to 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 read out loud to to some extent, yes. Um, I would hope it would change more than, than it actually does. Have you found something that you kind of fall into as a comfort level? Yeah, yeah, yeah. and I, I'm a little disappointed in myself for that. I mean, <laughs> I, would like, I would like them to be a little... A little looser in that way. Um, I tend to always read the through line first, and I'm beginning to think, well, maybe I should wait, you know, and read other things and let that be in the middle, or you know, somehow pull it all together at the end. But yeah, <laughs> yeah. For someone just purchasing a copy of your book, um, when you read these poems, you repeated certain lines mm -hmm. more than once. And is there any clue or hint that you give a reader just of the work on the page that giving permission to do that or hinting that that's an option because that's not something right. readers would naturally 
Yeah, um, I do have, like, a, I have a little reader's note at the beginning of the book, and I, I think I would always include that, which says basically what I said for these poems, through lines and bold offer a way in, and then other words constellate around the through lines, and readers are free to move about the page as they please. Um, the poems open into three-dimensional space where things can happen simultaneously and different with each reading. So I do, like, clue the reader into that, but that repetition, um, you don't necessarily have to do that, but I, I would hope that after you got used to this, in the same way when you're looking at a painting, you feel free to go back to, you know, a corner of it that you looked at before, like, that, that hopefully once you get used to this, you, you aren't led by the linearity or the expectations of normal reading anymore, and that would let you go back. Um, I don't know how, you know, where the permission, like where the prohibition comes from. I guess that's the question, like to eliminate the prohibition rather than giving permission. I don't know how you do that, but <laughs> that's what I would like. Yeah. I'm also thinking that if, if the lines were not repeated, the poem would sound very different. Yeah. 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 Um, how did you come up with this? Did you just have an idea, or did it sort of develop naturally from other poems you were working on? It pretty much developed from other poems I was working on. And what happens um, for me and has uh, uh, through all my, all like as long as I've been writing poems, which is a long time, I'll come to a place and I'll be bored with what I'm doing and I'll have to like, I'll be so bored with it that I'll get angry and I'll like have to do something else. And I think like too many words has gotten, I, I've gotten angry at having in my own poems too many words. So like to like take that, take it apart in some way to, to it wasn't so much an idea as just like the necessity of moving into a, fa into a form that could represent where I was in my own thinking about how a poem operates. Does that? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, just that, that made me think that uh, you have uh, angry, angry uh, acts also of uh, having read something yourself that was um, very spare and very powerful mm -hmm. and very direct. And uh, just make a fast response to that. Say that again. So you, you said that partly you just get bored and get angry. Um, I just was responding to that, shift things around. Too many words in particular was said. Too many words. Right. So maybe, maybe think, had you read something or were you reading things or reading a particular, particular author who was particularly spare, particularly powerful, particularly direct, oh. that you were responding to? Yeah, that, w I, that was more a model for me, yeah. Um, probably I was, and probably it would have been... A, a few poets who I was reading when I first started making poems this way. Um, Gustav Sobin, who is very spare and whose poems move down, down the page in a similar way, and, and Rene Sharf, for sure, um, who's more, they, his poems more work like uh, aphorisms, but you know, if, if you open them up, y you can fill up a whole page with one. So, Maybe, yeah, that's a good question. And, and I think those were, and then also I think um, uh, land artists, you know, who like Richard Long or, or uh, Jim mentioned Andy Goldworthy, who, who, Goldsworthy, whose work I think of as very spare poetry in, in the world at large. Um, yeah. Is there any way in which your um, translation work and your poetry um, inform each other? <coughs> yeah, for sure. Um, just because if you translate, you are working in the medium of language really closely all the time. And it's not at the 
point where you're creating it, like where you're putting the ideas in. You're, you're, it's just your, your, like your wool, your, your yarn, you know, whatever. So that kind of s having that kind of like practice of language as this stuff that can do things differently depending on the language you're in um, is at the heart of these poems, I think. Um, which you see in like where, you know, the mountain swallows the, end, the rest of the sun or it's mountain swallows. Like just that a word can be a verb or a noun. Um, and can be both at the same time if if you do it right. And then in another language, it's not going to be that word. You know, it'll it'll be a different word. Or just the physical textures of words, the way they, you know, the way they what they do in your mouth, what they do in your throat, um, all those things. It's it becomes very material, and then and then it it can be worked with in your own language in a way that is uh, more aware of the materiality of it than you are if it's what you talking in. Yeah. An example of that, if you're curious, is Jody has a book, Translations from Bark Beetle. And the premise of the book is translating from the forms that, for instance, that bark beetles make under, under bark, or there's a raven poem that you translate into raven, really, or into English. But it's the, the role of translator and the role of poet in that book are explored really directly. And very, um, I would say, with amusement as well as precision. I think it's sort of the whole, the whole project is to expand the field of language um, beyond, you know, the way humans communicate with each other in, into something that, that is, is bigger and more uh, based in, in, you know, the in environment, the habitat. Yeah. Other things? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I hope this is not too simplistic, but I get a little bit of flavor when you have a refrigerator door and you put <laughs> words and phrases on it. Oh, yeah. And then you invite other people to move them around in yeah. a different way. Right. Is that too no, that's fine. Yeah, it is a magnetic poetry of a certain kind. It's also been uh, compared to choose your own adventure books. Um, which, yeah, I love that. Like these are you choose your own adventure poems. So yeah, yeah, good. Well, maybe that's a good place to end. Thank you. Jody,